Good evening from India and good morning or good afternoon to those of you joining us from around this world. As we host this seminar, malnutrition continues to plague the world. In these times, even as we acknowledge the magnitude of the challenge that faces the world, we know that learning from success can be invigorating and inspiring. And therefore, in today's program, we will hear, um, we will hear findings, um, uh, we will hear a range of research findings, sorry, on successes in tackling what has been considered to be an absolutely stubborn malnutrition challenge, reducing childhood stunting, joining forces across IFPRI's research program on stories of change in nutrition, and the exemplars in global health program of work today. We have a panel of speakers who bring tremendous expertise in global health, nutrition, and development. The case studies we will hear about today span the globe, and we will learn both about what contributed to stunting declines in these countries and about how change occurred. Adding to the national case studies we will hear about today are a set of sub-national case studies from India, offering perspectives on progress within a nation. Our, our panel today includes uh, Johan or Yo Swinnan, Director General at, at IFPRI. Welcome, Yo. Niranjan Bose, Managing Director for Health and Life Sciences at Gates Ventures. Welcome, Niranjan. So glad you can join us today. Zulfi Bhutta, Zulfi Karputta, co-director of the Center for Global Health at the University of Toronto and founding director of the Center for Excellence in Women and Child Health at Aga Khan University. Zulfi, as I know him, led the EGH case studies with his research team and many partners and is also chair of the technical advisory group for the EGH India program of work. Wel welcome, Zulfi. Stuart Gillespie, senior research fellow at IFPRI who read the story, led the Stories of Change initiative um, and then on the, on the subnational case studies, um, I'm really pleased to have with us Rasmi Abula, who is a research fellow at IFPRI and who led the work on IFPRI subnational case studies of success in India, as well as Drishti Sharma, who's manager access and health policy research, IRB India, who currently leads the research on the EGH India subnational case studies. Before we kick off the panel though, it's only fitting that we host this today, a day after Stuart Gillespie retires from IFPRI. Stuart, many of us know that deep case studies have been a forte of your research portfolio. When I began working with you on stories of change in 2015, I had not realized the impact that studying successes would have on me as a researcher or really on the world out there. But I think you had the foresight to see that people want to see solutions to the nutrition challenge in a way that aligns with the realities of national and subnational policy making. So as you step down from IFPRI, I'm gonna use the, the platform of this seminar to thank you for your leadership in the field uh, and to honor your, that investment uh, through the seminar as well today. Thank now you. to our Funny audience, <laughs> before I, we had to embarrass you one more time, you know. Uh, now to the audience, we would like to hear from you throughout the seminar. So please submit your brief questions um, wherever you're watching the seminar on ifpre.org, on our Facebook page, LinkedIn, YouTube, or if you're watching it on Twitter by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter, and we will do our best to address your questions in the Q&A session. Uh, so now let's kick off, and I invite uh, Yo, uh, IFPRI's Director General, to open this policy seminar with a few words. Over to you, Yo. Thanks very much, Purnima. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to open the seminar. I'm, I'm really looking forward uh, to this. The, the title of today's seminar, as I'm sure you all know, is Tackling Child Undernutrition at Scale, Insights from National and Subnational Success Cases. And obviously in today's world, this is a really important issue and therefore an important event. Even before the pandemic, uh, child undernutrition was not improving fast enough. We know that about 144 million children have suffered, were suffering from stunting, 47 million were suffering from wasting. And why is nutrition so important? Well, nutrition is important, I think, in general as, as a basic human uh, need. But nutrition-related factors contribute to about 45% uh, of deaths in children. And largely, these are due to infectious diseases. Undernutrition in early life has long-term consequences on cognitive development, on schooling, wages, integration, empowerment in society. And the damage, as we know now, is largely irreversible. These were the situations before COVID-19 and COVID-19 has made the situation significantly worse. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, led to a combination of factors which have all uh, reinforced the, the problems. 
the reduction in livelihoods, losses in income, jobs, gaps in protection, social protection programs and breakdown of a number of systems have all led to poorer diets and nutrition. And we know that these have disproportionately affected the most vulnerable groups in society, which includes the children. Uh, recent research from IFPRI estimates that child wasting could increase by almost 7 million people worldwide compared to the no COVID projection, which is a huge increase. And so clearly, if there was not already an urgent need for rapid progress on child nutrition, it, COVID-19 has reinforced that this is certainly the case now. Now, interesting, there are also reasons to be optimistic, and Punima already uh, referred to um, the initiatives here uh, led by uh, Stuart initially on um, focusing on success stories. And today we will look at evidence from uh, success stories in improving nutrition. And so the presentation will draw from true global research programs. One is IFPRI Stories of Change, and the other is the Exemplars in Global Health, an organization which is co-organizing this event. Since 2015, Stories of Change at IFPRI has sought to inform action and inspire change for better nutrition. It is drawing on the experiences of policymakers, of nutrition leaders, program managers, and implementers in making decisions on what to do in real time and in real country context. The findings of the project is showing the importance of both direct nutrition interventions and indirect sectoral actions. The findings also highlight the importance, the pivotal importance of commitment, of coherence, of capacity and of leadership. And the project has gone beyond just analyzing and identifying success story, but also has actively engaged with wide audiences to bring the important story to those who can enact change in this case, in nutrition policies and programs. It's been an, um, a pleasure and a very productive cooperation with the exemplars in uh, global health. And this program also aims to help public health decisions in ide by identifying and unpacking success stories and adapting lessons learning to other contexts. I must say, in my career, I have also spent a lot of time um, analyzing developments in the world by focusing on success stories. In my case, it was mostly on, on value chain developments, etc. And I have appreciated very much how not only focusing on negative events, but also on how systems come out positively can really contribute to much in, insights. And in this today listening, I look really forward to listening to the the lineup of a very illustrious speakers, I think, who will present some of these success stories in nutrition and offer directions for countries aiming to accelerate progress on nutrition. Over to you, Purnima. Uh, Thank you so much, Yo. That was a great introduction. Um, and I'm glad we can showcase the set of case studies uh, for, for, for all of IFPRI and beyond. Um, I now turn to, uh, to Bose from Gates, Gates Ventures to tell us a little bit about the global program of work and exemplars that he leads. Over to you, Bose. Well, thank you, Punima. Good morning, good afternoon from Seattle. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to join our partners and share more about the Exemplars program. Uh, the Exemplars in Global Health program started about four years ago and it started as an incubation in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we launched publicly last year, the middle of 2020 during the pandemic. And as you'll see in the next slide, this work is not possible without a global village of partners. And some of our partners are represented here uh, today, including IFPRI. And Exemplars is grounded in the simple premise that the quickest path to success at scale is to identify who has done this before, what can we learn from them, and how do we uh, adapt those approaches to our uh, individual context and circumstances. And we're very grateful to the partners, uh, including uh, Sick Kids, IFPRI, and uh, Ayavi India joining us today in this seminar. On the next slide, uh, it gives you uh, an idea of the range of topics that the program has been working on. We began with stunting reduction in partnership with uh, Dr. Butta and colleagues. And uh, the map shows you the range of uh, geographies that have been uh, under study. Some of them complete in dark blue, some of them in progress in the lighter shades. 
and of course the India subnational study. And as you click through the slide, uh, also illustrates the richness of the topic expansions that have happened over time, largely in part to some of the early successes that we were finding in our ability to do this work and also ability to uh, share this work uh, with um, uh, our partners, our in-country partners, and some of our uh, strategic collaborators. The most recent addition, as shown in the far left, uh, is some best practices in COVID-19 response, as well as uh, uh, maternal anemia exemplars. Again, a body of work uh, being led by Dr. Butta and colleagues. On the next slide, illustrates how we go about doing this work. What you're going to hear about today is largely on one topic, but this illustrative approach is common to all the topics that we work on. Uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, we want to acknowledge that none of this work is possible without our partners. And when I say exemplars in global health, the program, I'm referring not just to the Gates Ventures team or the Gates Foundation team, but the larger ecosystem of partners, the cross-country research partners, the in-country research partners, the technical advisors who make this uh, the success that it's been so far. On the middle represents the core team of the Gates uh, Foundation and Gates Ventures teams that helps synthesize these findings to make it adaptable and to localize it to the various uh, avenues shown on the far right, the online platform, the dissemination activities, and most importantly, hands-on service opportunities where we're trying to lock arms with the folks who are developing the investment cases or the policy documents with the ultimate goal of driving to impact. On the last slide, um, I just want to close by showing that there are, um, uh, if we can advance, maybe maybe we don't have that slide. Uh, it, it was just meant to show that there are multiple ways you can reach us. One of them is our online platform, exemplars.health. And there's also on that site, you can reach us. If you have technical questions, you can use the ask an expert function. Or if you want a deeper service engagement, there's also a way you can reach us via the online portal. And uh, we look forward to working with you and continuing this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, both. That is an absolutely impressive uh, portfolio. And um, it has been really an honor to be associated and affiliated with some parts of it. So we really can't wait to learn more as the rest of it unfolds. Um, so let me now uh, turn over to, to Stuart. As I mentioned earlier, Stuart and a team of researchers led by him initiated a set of nutrition success cases here at IFPRI as well. Uh, and Stuart will now tell us a little bit about that overall program of work before we dive into to research finding. Um, so Stuart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Panima. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of stories of change. It was an idea that we had um, after the second Lancet series in which Panima, myself and others did a fourth paper, which was focused on pol the politics of reducing malnutrition. Subsequently, we realized we needed to dig deeper into the question of what drives success in terms of scaling up um, a mix of nutrition relevant actions to achieve impact. And uh, next slide, please. And we did that uh, in 2014. It was published in 2015 in Advances in Nutrition, a detailed, as I say, a detailed review of, of the drivers of success in scaling up uh, a mix of, of relevant actions. And one of the key findings is uh, quoted here. We found that there was uh, a strong consensus on what needs to be done, but much less was really known about how to operationalize a prioritize appropriate mix of actions in different contexts, and that's a key phrase, uh, and to do so at scale uh, in a way that actually linked in the way we defined it then, nutrition-specific or direct and nutrition-sensitive interventions. Um, and we then asked ourselves, well, how are we going to do that? And, and I think we, we realized quickly that what we needed to do is go much deeper in different contexts, develop a set of case studies. Some of those, most of those were national, uh, some was state level, which I'll describe. I worked on this kind of thing 30 years ago when I was with the Subcommittee of Nutrition in Geneva. And I realized that so much more is possible now. We have more experience to draw on, 
of 30 years worth, at least. Um, we have more political commitment uh, to address uh, malnutrition. We have more data. We have data on drivers. We have data on, on programs and, and, and policies. But we also have more tools in terms of our uh, ability to analyze what is happening. And that includes, importantly, within, if you like, the black box of political economy of, of nutrition. So putting all that together, we decided we'd set out and, and try to develop a, a series of case studies. Next slide, please. And, uh, and then we realized, well, we need to actually understand experience, the real time challenges and how to grapple with those challenges, which are faced by everyone from grassroots mothers and communities, frontline workers, right away up to policy makers. And in a way, we use this simple, very simplistic sort of uh, uh, mantra, really, which is knowledge equals evidence plus experience. We have a lot of evidence. We get a lot of that from the Lancet series, for example, but we nearly, really need to look at, at experience and so to understand the how questions. So we need to learn from real world. Um, and, that, and that was a, a major part of this. Next slide, please. So the stories of change had these primary objectives. Firstly, to better understand the drivers, the pathways, and the challenges. It, so change and challenge go together. They have very similar words. Uh, and and um, we were really, it was important that we understood where, where the obstacles were and where sometimes they were not surmounted overall, but other possibilities were, where uh, opportunities were taken. So drivers, pathways, and challenges that influenced political commitment, policy and program coherence, and ultimately the implementation of, of a set of nutrition relevant actions. Second, and importantly, this wasn't just an academic exercise. We wanted to foster an experiential learning process with all partners, um, importantly, obviously, with key partners in, in country based on real time documentation of change and sharing ideas across national boundaries. Right from the get go, right from the start, we involved uh, key people in policymakers in actually helping to design uh, aspects of the study to start with. And ultimately, it was, again, two pronged to inform, but also to inspire uh, and to motivate change. And that's, that's both left brain and right brain. We wanted to, to, to tap into the kind of the creative, motivational aspects of this work as well. Next slide, please. And um, this just briefly highlights the main countries. We've been working on this now, as I say, since 2015. We've had three waves of studies. I think there's something like 15 to 18 case, study, uh, case studies available now. The first wave, 2015 to 17, um, in the countries listed out here. Uh, and then we, um, and it, we were able to carry on and work in Western Africa with a Transform Nutrition West Africa program and also with Poshan and with Panema leading that and Razmi in India and other case studies in Africa and, and Vietnam in, this, in the second wave. Now, these were all... Um, well, not all, but mainly there were kind of positive outliers. These were countries that achieved relative success, relative to their economic performance over time, significant uh, positive success in driving down rates of, uh, of child stunting. Um, there were high burden countries earlier on. There were countries that had shown real political commitment. And judging by the trends, there were countries where there was an acceleration of improvement over the time periods that we looked. And we looked primarily between 2000 and 2015 uh, was the time period that we actually adopted for that. And we worked uh, with partners, uh, particularly Institute of Development Studies in the UK, partners uh, in each country, key organizations, consultants worked, uh, working with them directly. Um, I'll just say um, a few words about the methods. We had a sort of twin pronged approach. Firstly, literature review of key drivers, what was available already in each of these contexts, uh, a landscaping of policies and programs um, that were relevant to nutrition, stakeholder mapping, looking at power connections, looking at the way communications worked within countries, who was talking to whom uh, across national contexts. Uh, we adopted and led by Derek Eady of IFPRI a, a set of uh, quantitative analyses, decom decomposition and analyses of repeated DHS data sets to understand the quantitative uh, statistical drivers of change, usually at the underlying level. And then we looked, we, we adopted a series of key interviews with key informants, a set of focus groups. And throughout all this, we held repeat consultations with key stakeholders as we went along, uh, culminating in, in learning events. I'll leave it to that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Stuart. Yes, absolutely. An impressive portfolio there uh, as well. Um, uh, before we move on to the to the to the next set of findings from uh, that uh, that uh, Sophie will share with us, I would like to remind all of you tuning in live that you can send us your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag of hashtag of ifpre on Twitter. Um, so so hold tight because now we move on to hear about some of the exciting findings and the insights from the findings of work done across uh, the various uh, countries. So I'd now like to invite uh, Zulfi Bhutta to share findings from these. Zulfi will focus primarily on the uh, exemplars and global health country case studies that he has led with partners, um, but will also reflect on the consolidated findings across the exemplars in global health and the stories of change um, uh, countries that have been consolidated in the Lancet Nutrition Series just launched. So over to you, Sophie. And again, thank, thank you very you. much, Pranima, and thank you, Stuart, for uh, setting the stage on some of the methodology, the exemplars work that I'm going to share with you and expand upon um, was comparable to what the Stories of Change work started with some, some differences. And principally, the objective of all of this was to try and identify positive outliers countries that had achieved a reasonable reduction in stunting over and beyond what economic growth would have indicated overall. And to give you an example, if you were to take uh, in our phase one, when we looked at GDP per capita income change over time, a, a compound annual growth rate, for example, between 2000 and 2016, and plotted against that stunting prevalence change or reduction, you got a sense of what average stunting reductions were like. And against this was a backdrop of countries that had obviously done better than uh, what would have been accountable from just economic reduction alone. And some of them are mentioned here. And our main interest in phase one was to try and identify a few countries where we could go with partners and do an in-depth look in terms of what really drove change and what could we learn from some of these in-country processes uh, in terms of emulation within the region or in global context. So none of this work uh, would have been possible without partnerships with countries. And in these five case studies, we had um, strong local partners in Central Asia, uh, in Kyrgyz Republic, the University of Central Asia, for example, and even in um, uh, some typical contexts. Uh, where there wasn't a strong academic presence. I seem to have lost my slides. Can you see my slides? Yeah, we, we had academic public health uh, programs that we partnered with. We were supported by a very strong technical advisory group to which I'm very grateful, who were able to guide us throughout this process. Um, as we um, explored uh, the situation in many of these countries, um, I, we realized that the rate of change uh, over time in many of these countries was comparable in, uh, in between two and a half to three to four percent annual reduction in stunting that was observed. But you will notice that the baseline stunting rates in these countries were different. These two countries at the top that are seen over here, uh, uh, and they represent Ethiopia and Nepal, started off with stunting rates as high as 60, 70 percent. And they were able to reduce it quite significantly. But even by the time they ended up around 2016, 17, they still had pretty high stunting rates. So we were looking at different contexts, uh, contexts where development uh, uh, situation was relatively poor and uh, child mortality and other background rates of infant health were poorer and others where there was already a backdrop of development and, and change had still occurred in terms of reduction in stunting. They're very interesting examples in, in these countries. Uh, we had the benefit of uh, being able to apply a framework which is very well recognized in terms of looking at both basic drivers, underlying social determinants, uh, uh, things that were intermediate related to economics, food availability, practices, and more immediate drivers, uh, which related to dietary intake or disease burden patterns. And importantly, in this methodology, we were able to look at what might be intergenerational transfer of growth potential and also interventions that could have impacted nutrition outcomes. Um, 
the methodology for this, as Stuart uh, uh, indicated, was fairly similar to what drivers of change had. That we had a literature review, quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis, going back and forth and trying to triangulate that against policies and programs, and eventually ending up with a strong basis for synthesizing all of this together into what would be a country picture, which we then validated against uh, what policymakers were telling us. And, and towards the latter end of a country case study, went back to the field with strategic focus group discussions to try and validate what our final assessments were. So to cut a long story short, with these five country case studies that we did in the first round, uh, you will find that there are subtle differences and that in all of these countries, it appears that there is a mixed contribution of both direct nutrition and health interventions, but also of things that are outside of all of this, economic development, education, agriculture, food security, and also something that has really confused the development sector in the last few years is the evidence around water sanitation and hygiene. But when you look at all of these countries, it is possible to explain why. For example, in Kyrgyz Republic, you don't seem to have a lot of um, contribution to the overall reduction in stunting from water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, or for many of the health interventions, it is because when Kyrgyz Republic started off, it started off with a very high level of coverage. And therefore, in many of these contexts, the contribution to reduction in stunting of various factors was very much dependent upon where those countries were at the state of development when our analysis and evaluation started. But the overall findings from this uh, decomposition was very interesting in that we were getting a clear signal that this was, as had been predicted in 2013, a combination of nutrition sensitive and specific interventions with almost an equal contribution if you take on average. In some instances, it was more from sectors outside of nutrition and health, and in others, it was comparable. And these, which are now being termed as direct and indirect uh, nutrition and health interventions, uh, were consistent across these five case studies in, in different manners. Now, we were able to expand this and to look at also the experience that came in from the drivers of change work that Stuart was talking about. And in the most recent Lancet series, we've looked at that, and I'll show you that in a minute. But I want to point out to one very interesting observation, which was that these countries had a very different pathway in terms of how they address change. So if you take, just take one measure, equity. So in some countries, clearly reduction in stunting was because of a reduction in inequities. And if you see that in the slide that uh, I hope will come on the screen in a second, in Kyrgyz Republic and, and, and Peru, for example, it was through a reduction in inequities over time. But in others, it was actually not associated with the reduction in inequities. If anything, inequity worsened. And that gives a very strong signal that if some of the other, these other countries were able to target and also impact the poorest of the poor, the marginalized populations with their interventions, they could have increased the impact for what they got to. I mean, most of these other countries that I've just mentioned, Kyrgyz Republic started off with a very egalitarian background in the backdrop of the Soviet system, where there was not a lot of differential in primary health care. But in other instances, those differences exist, and they offer us a great opportunity of moving forward. As I mentioned, we've recently now looked at the entire experience of not just the exemplars, work, but also the stories of change and summarized that in the Lancet series that just came out a couple of weeks ago. And if you look at that bigger picture in terms of what's happened across these 11 countries and four Indian states that you will hear about in a minute, uh, the picture is very similar. Uh, yes, the amount of uh, uh, explanation of how much stunting can be attributed to these factors may differ across these uh, uh, studies, but broadly the messages are very consistent, that you need a mixture of both, and that addressing social determinants through sectors like poverty alleviation, environmental change towards sanitation hygiene and parental education, broadly accounts for about half of all observed a reduction in stunting. And there are enabling factors clearly that are important in all of this, such as high level political donor commitment, advocacy, and importantly, data. So information for accountability and change is a dominant message that comes out of these exemplar countries. They're for planning purposes, for recalibration, 
and for going back and doing more in, in certain regions where there was a need, it required granular level subnational information. Now, as I close, all of this has enabled us to provide a new framework for looking at this that we've recently just put out in Lance Child and Adolescent Health with our Nutrition Interventions Review. And they very clearly classify things that you can do from the nutrition and health sector, both in terms of direct nutrition interventions and things that relate to things that may enable nutrition interventions to be more effective, such as, for example, family planning. It's role in countries where women have poor nutrition, and I don't know why these slides are not moving, uh, where women have poor nutrition because of high fertility rates, um, because of short interpregnancy intervals and high rates of adolescent pregnancy, these are extremely important. But sectors outside of this also are hugely important in terms of addressing nutrition. And you can see all of them here. They relate to things that require broad things like fortification, food pricing interventions, social safety nets, importantly, party alleviation strategies that are focused largely on women and, and women's empowerment and, and, and universal uh, education with a focus on reducing gender inequities. So I'll stop at this to say this is really work in progress and we hope to learn more over the next few years from additional exemplar countries and also how countries can reduce undernutrition without necessarily having the blowback of increasing double burden in some of those circumstances. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Zulfi. That was an absolutely masterful, if I may say so, uh, sort of overview of the journey of work, uh, very intensive work that has happened uh, through the exemplars and the integration of that work into the Lancet Nutrition Series. I, I think if without, if even with this work, we can't convince national governments that they need to invest in cross-sectoral and multi-sectoral actions, uh, I'm not sure what will convince people. So, so I really look forward to us taking this forward. Now, of course, the changes that we see in the various countries, uh, some have happened by default, some have happened by, by, by design. Um, and, and understanding the how of that is, is really quite critical. So let me invite Stuart back now to share some insights you know, from the work that's been summarized in the Lancet series and the stories of change uh, work. I, I think lots of similarities across the case studies that we've been looking at on the house. So over to you again, Stuart. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Panima. And yes, you're absolutely right. There are, there are similarities, um, important similarities uh, between exemplars and stories of change findings, fortunately, um, um, and in terms of the how and the drivers and the higher level, if you like, enabling environment, policy level um, uh, factors that seem to be related to relative success. Next slide, please. Um, this is, oh, I think you may have missed the last one there, but it's okay. This is a, I've got two slides. This is the first one. Everything is on this slide, um, pretty much, but uh, it needs to be described. Um, in, in our first wave of studies, we had six uh, case studies, and subsequently, uh, the findings from the second wave tended to back more or less the main uh, higher level findings from, from the first set of case studies in terms of enabling environment factors. Now, the list here shows some of the, those key factors and processes. And obviously, the devil is in the detail, and we haven't got time to go into the detail. We'll hear from India. But um, uh, the, the original um, individual case studies will, will have that detail. So I'm going to go through some of the factors which were seen to be pretty key overall. Not every single success story had every single one of these factors act, uh, over time, um, but they were seen ultimately cumulatively to be pretty important. The first one, commitment. Now, commitment is a big word and it means many things. It, for us, we tried for our studies, we tried to unpack commitment, and we realized there were different forms. There was political attention, which would be a prime minister or president talking about nutrition. There was policy next level down, or uh, would be policy uh, commitment in terms of the uh, actions or their stated intent to, um, uh, to act on certain problems being shown in, in policy documents. The next 
level would be institutional commitment. And there you're moving into action areas. That's when jobs start to change, to prioritize nutrition, job descriptions, roles and responsibilities. And then the fourth aspect or type of commitment is financial commitment. When money gets allocated, some of that's new money, some of it's reallocation to address nutrition. Second key factor, program and policy coherence. And that we saw as operating along two axes. Uh, horizontal refers to the cross-sectoral, so that is health, agriculture, social welfare, education, talking the same language, interacting, communicating, looking for opportunities uh, for potentially co-locating programs or integrating programs. Second axis, vertical axis. And that would be, that's essentially from policy level right down to the grassroots level. Coherence along each step of that in terms of people knowing what they are supposed to be doing and they're being, and, and this leads to the third key factor, accountability. That the roles and responsibilities are clear. There is power to back up uh, an authority to back up uh, those, uh, to, to enable, uh, those roles and responsibilities to be to be adopted. Accountability tended to flow downwards more to communities, not just upwards in terms of sending data up to central levels. Fourth, and that leads us to data. Data is key as well as evidence. And now it's really important, I think, the steps that have been taken in recent years to to articulate what we mean by the value chain, chain for data. And as every step, and it's a circular, it's an iterative cycle, every step from the prioritization of key data needs to the collection of those data through to their use or their, their packaging and their communication and their use to inform actions. And then you, the next step is the monitoring and evaluation and the cycle continues. Data and evidence being granular, uh, incorporating intersectionality, uh, we found to be absolutely key. Fifth, capacity. Capacity at different levels, individual in terms of the skills and tools, community level, organizational level, and then ultimately uh, at a national level, systemic capacity in terms of how organizations and institutions interact with each other to benefit nutrition. Uh, sixth, leadership was absolutely pivotal uh, throughout all these case studies, and that's leadership crucially at all levels, again, uh, policy right down to grassroots levels. And in, in many ways, leadership is transformational capacity uh, that we found to, to, to operate uh, when we're talking about sectors. It's the ability to learn the language and to talk the language of a different sector, to bring sectors together, to build alliances and to communicate uh, eff effectively. The seventh key driver, which I I'm not sure you can see is financing. Um, and as you would expect, you need mon money and, and funds. They need the funds need to be adequate, they need to be stable, and there needs to be flexibility built in uh, to ensure that uh, the, the funds can be used at local level for whatever is required at local level. So those are some of the key drivers that we found to be uh, in, in one single slide to be uh, important across all the case studies that we, we looked at. Next slide, please. And just to finish with, um, sh by showing you some of the key outputs that we have, and you can find these uh, by Googling, Stories of Change, if free. Uh, the first on the top left is the Nourishing Millions book, and that actually goes back 50 years to highlight some success stories in terms of interventions, in terms of countries, in terms uh, of, of leadership that we, uh, we've we highlighted in that book. And that was when we went through a long process of identifying those cases, and that came out in 2016. Below that, there's a global food security special issue that came out in 2017 with 10 papers from the first wave of studies. We've brought out policy briefs uh, on the top right. We've brought out audio visuals, which uh, and films and small video clips, which are available on the website. The food security uh, journal below is not out yet. Uh, it's coming out this year. That's another special issue, and that incorporates some of the third wave studies that which, which are now looking at the double burden of malnutrition, both under nutrition, but also uh, the challenges around addressing overweight and obesity. And there we're looking much more upstream at how to, how to engender political commitment in the first place, because we have less data in terms of programs and actions on overweight and obesity. And the, and the paper on the bottom uh, right there is the, is the Lancet, uh, the latest Lancet series paper. Um, so just to 
to uh, to remind that the devil is in the detail and that some of these papers are, are, are um, I mean, these papers at the individual level are key in terms of understanding the important factors in different contexts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. That's, that's a really, um, you know, powerhouse of, uh, of, again, a collection of uh, evidence and outputs from this work and, and just some really tremendous insights on the, you know, the things that need to come together and that the things that came together to create. And for me, one of the big questions that always comes up is how do we create that full cluster of seven major issues by design, you know, what we've learned from success is that often these things have happened and we know that they've driven success. But I think the challenge of our lifetimes in a sense is how do we create those ingredients by design to, to lead to success? Um, now we're gonna switch gears just a little bit uh, and move to hear about the subnational case studies. Uh, there are, as, as we've seen from, from the slides that, that both showed in several countries, there are various subnational case studies uh, being undertaken. Um, and we have a sort of a first set here, uh, cutting across both the stories of change work and the um, um, uh, EGH work that, that we are able to share with you today. Uh, they come from India. Um, the largest burden of child undernutrition in the world today is seen in India. However, neither the burden of undernutrition nor the trajectories of progress in India have been uniform. Um, I, I think those of us who work uh, with, you know, with country governments and others realize that progress in subnational units within large countries has the same potential that we have seen with um, progress in, in national units, which is that they really have the potential to inform policy within countries to inspire other states um, and units operating within the same national frameworks. And by collecting them, we also have an opportunity to support learning around, around the national, subnational uh, linkages, uh, the vertical coherence kinds of issues around the world. Uh, so we've had the privilege of building on the Stories of Change framework to undertake a few case studies in India. And I'm really pleased now to invite Rasmi Avala to first share insights from that work uh, with us. And then we'll, we'll hear from Drishti Sharma at IRB as well. So over to you, Rasmi. Thank you, Purnima. Welcome, everyone. Greetings from India. The work I'm about to present uh, became possible through the efforts of several colleagues at IFPRI, uh, collaborators, and support from the, the state governments. Next slide, please. India is home for a sixth of the world's population, and it contributes to a third of the global burden of undernutrition. Between 2006 and 2016, stunting declined from 48 to 38% in India among children below five years of age. The progress, however, was not uniform across states. To understand factors driving improvements at the state level, we conducted success case studies. Chhattisgarh, Gujarat, and Odisha, these three states were chosen uh, because decline in stunting in absolute terms was high in these states and greater than the national average. It ranged between 11 to 15 percentage points. Tamil Nadu was chosen as a, a success case study, as a historical case study for its uh, low prevalence of stunting. All four states are considered to be large states in India, and their population ranges between 30 to 70 million. Tamil Nadu and Gujarat uh, are among the wealthy states, while Odisha and Chhattisgarh are considered poor states with more than a third of um, population below the poverty line. Next slide, please. We began our case studies by asking four questions. How did determinants of child growth change over time? What factors contributed to stunting decline? We turned to UNICEF conceptual framework to identify the various determinants of uh, child nutrition. And using that, we then turned to the uh, two rounds of national family health survey uh, data set to develop a data timeline, looking at the immediate determinants, the underlying determinants, and the uh, various uh, nutrition and health interventions, and how their prevalence and coverage changed over a period of time. To understand what factors contributed to stunting decline, we use the same data set and uh, conduct a regression decomposition analysis. 
to answer the question on the what policy efforts related to the key determinants that contributed to changes in stunting, we conducted a desk review of literature published as well as gray literature. And to understand what drove the policy changes, uh, we conducted interviews with stakeholders in the government, non-government, civil society, development partners. So uh, now I'll present the findings across uh, the four states without going deep into each state uh, story. Next slide, please. Multiple determinants improved between 2006 and 2016. That's what we found uh, looking at the changes uh, in the data timeline. On the screen, you'll see uh, a set of uh, graphs. In the first panel, you'll notice under the first panel on changes in immediate determinants, examining the data across from the left to right, we see that the across the states, the immediate determinants uh, improved across board. The um, proportion of women with low BMI declined, which is good, and uh, declined to about less than 30% across board. A mixed picture, however, emerged when we look at infant and young child feeding practices. While breastfeeding practices improved across the states, uh, exclusive breastfeeding did not in uh, Chhattisgarh. Complementary feeding practices as measured by adequate diet were low to begin with, less than 20% in 2006, but uh, by 2016, there was further decline, except in one state. In Tamil Nadu, it increased between 2006 and 2016, more than double reaching around 30%. Moving on to the next set of the determinants, the underlying determinants, the, in the second panel, the indicators pertaining to the household access to drinking water and electricity improved across board and reached more than 90%. Looking at the uh, improvements related to maternal education and aged marriage also improved but women's education greater than 10 years of schooling still was at below 25% uh, in all states, except again in Tamil Nadu with, where it was more than 60%. There were substantial improvements in sanitation as well across the states. However, in 2016, still only less than 60% were using improved sanitation facilities. Odisha was except, kind of an exception where only 27% of households in 2016 had a improved sanitation facilities. On the coverage of interventions in the last panel, there is a remarkable improvement across the first thousand days uh, for health and nutrition interventions. And this reached uh, for most of the indicators more than 70% coverage, which is really encouraging. In Tamil Nadu, there was a slight decline in antenatal care and in uh, full immunization. On closer examination, if we look at the Tamil Nadu case, the prevalence rates for several indicators in 2000 for Tamil Nadu were similar to where the other states reached in 2016. So overall improvements were observed across several determinants in all states. Next slide, please. Our analysis, next slide, please. Our analysis of factors contributing to changes in stunting points that multiple determinants contributed to the changes. Between 11 to 23% of change in stunting was contributed by changes to coverage of health and nutrition interventions, the highest being in Odessa followed by Chhattisgarh. Socioeconomic status was another major contributing factor and it ranged between 11 to 30% and the highest being in Tamil Nadu. Changes in maternal factors contributed to between 11 to 26% of change in stunting. And all these factors uh, and 19% of change in uh, sanitation contributed to change in stunting in Tamil Nadu. All these factors together explain between 60 to 86 percent of change in stunting across the states. The unexplained part suggests that there are additional factors that were not captured in our analysis. Overall, the findings of these analysis reiterate that stunting requires multi-sectoral interventions. Next slide, please. Our analysis of policy efforts pertaining to key determinants indicates that states implemented national programs and introduced their own state level initiatives. Regarding advancements in nutrition and health programs, there was a mandate for expansion of India's flagship programs for child development services and health programs. These national efforts provided resources that reinforced in, uh, developed infrastructure, put in human resources within the states. These success states 
took on the state program, the national program, as well as implemented certain state level initiatives pertaining to bolstering frontline worker programs, uh, implementing preventive and curative approaches for more, to address moderate and severe acute malnutrition, established public and private partnerships to reach uh, to bring care to the poor population. In two states, state-led maternity benefits program was implemented to provide compensation for loss of wages, um, as well as to improve access to uh, using use of antenatal care services. To improve food security, public distribution system in India provides grains to um, uh, at how to households at subsidized prices. Chhattisgarh, uh, Odisha, and Tamil Nadu implemented different varied modifications for these programs to ensure uh, reach is at maximum. Uh, put in place uh, in supply chain fixes to improve the implementation of the program. Uh, Tamil Nadu stands out in implementation of programs and policies for improving women's status, education, and raising age, age of marriage. Overall, states implemented various programs that indicate the reasons for changes in various determinants of stunting. Next slide, please. Our desk review and stakeholder interview analysis provides clues to what is it that set these states apart from the rest. Across the states, there was a vision for improvement in the state status, whether it's related to poverty, IMR, or MMR, or health and nutrition. This vision provided impetus to implementation of various programs, bolstered by the enabling policy environment, which included political stability, political leadership at the highest level, uh, followed by capable bureaucracy and stable bureaucracy. There were champions within and outside of the government, and there were development partner organizations such as the World Bank, UNICEF differed that provided support for implementation of the programs through technical support or through um, resources. So several elements came together uh, for these uh, success to, uh, to facilitate improvements in the determinants of uh, nutrition. To conclude, stunting decline and poor states in the, was facilitated by improvements in multiple determinants, including change in coverage of health and nutrition interventions, as well as improvements in maternal factors and the socioeconomic status. These changes were possible due to the presence of enabling pol political uh, environment as well as bureaucratic uh, capability. This reiterates that uh, the importance of equal emphasis is needed on both nutrition specific and nutrition sensitive interventions as well as looking at all the determinants of nutrition. Looking ahead, the states have to focus on addressing the lagging determinants there is a long way to go on IVCF practices, maternal education, and age of marriage. Just as there is state uh, interstate uh, variability, there exists interdistrict variability. So it is time to unpack stories around interdistrict variability to further improvements in nutrition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasmi. Very, uh, really, very interesting to see. Uh, the pulling together of results across the states and and even though i'm a i'm a research partner in this we've been so far working on individual states so it's, it's really kind of uh, very exciting to see it uh, across states now the uh, exemplars and global health team has also been working on subnational case studies as as both mentioned earlier uh, and uh, it's really wonderful that they're also working on adding insights from other states that have seen stunting reduction in success in india uh, so it's been a real pleasure to have been able to build bridges and create strong linkages between the subnational case studies work of the Stories of Change team uh, and the exemplars and global health uh, exemplars and global health team uh, working on the India case studies. Now, full results for the EGH case studies in India are still uh, coming in. But in the meantime, I'm really happy to uh, to invite Trish Tristi Sharma, who's sharing sorry, who's leading these efforts with Ayavi to unfold a new set of state success case studies in India to share with us how they're approaching these um, and, and you know, tell us which state they're, they're taking on and when we can expect to learn from these. So over to you, Trishti. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present this upcoming work. As you rightly said that the research is still um, not as mature as the previous findings uh, that were presented and the main findings are still awaited. What, we'll, what I'll be taking you through is the overall approach and the overview of how we selected the states. 
Can we go to the next slide, please? This work is a joint effort by a team of researchers at IRV and working along with partners at PGI Chandigarh as well as Ames Delhi. We are guided by an expert group at India level. Uh, this is to ensure the political relevance or the policy level relevance of our work. And this group is chaired by Dr. Vinod Paul, who is a member at Niti Aayog Government of India. Further, the work is also advised and guided by a technical advisory group. The Global Technical Advisory Group ensures that there's the scientific rigor uh, that the study maintains. And uh, Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta, Dr. Ponima Menon are members of this advisory group amongst other experts. Knowledge Integration Translation Platform, it, IRV is one of the domain centers for the NIT at Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. And this study is co-funded by Department of Biotechnology as well as Gate Ventures. Can we go to the next slide? So just reiterating what is already what is already known that India, due to its large population and high prevalence of stunting, create, holds a large share of global burden of stunting. And therefore, in addition to the four states that Rashmi presented, we are talking about delving in deep in four more states from India other than the ones that were just discussed. Overall, um, Though the stunting has declined across time, the market feature of decline across stunting is um, the subnational disparity. And there has been a pol uh, the policy level appetite to learn from more states, to draw adaptable lessons from these states who have dis demonstrated exemplary declines in childhood stunting from the period of 1990 to 2020. The objectives would sound somewhat similar to what has been taken up in the previous studies, uh, that is, trying to identify the factors that have been responsible for change, trying to identify the policy drivers, as well as the pathways for change. And this knowledge overall can help the key decision makers to understand the unique challenges that were identified and overcome by planning a deliberate action at, at different levels. Next slide, please. So how did we choose the exemplar states? We tried to create an objective criteria uh, so that any state could get the benefit of getting selected. The data source that we used is the Demographic Health Service in India, National Health, it's also called the National Family Health Service. We chose the round three and four across 2005 to 15. And we chose the objective criteria as the prevalence of stunting, prevalence of severe stunting, prevalence of stunting in the poorest wealth quintile. And the metric for calculating the stunt, the decline was compounded annual rate of change. So a state to get selected as an exemplar state had to perform well in all these three criteria, and that too had to be above the median for the country. And as it's evident, this is a relative measure, and it's essentially these states that we have selected are first amongst the equals, and the entire country is still working on and progressing towards the goal of reducing childhood and nutrition. A caveat for studying exemplars across the time period is that the, the criteria that we are talking about are time sensitive. And if we move beyond this cycle, say, if we talk about the recent cycle 2000, till 2020, nothing guarantees that the states that have been selected in the first cycle would reappear in the next. The trajectories may change across time. The choices that the state makes changes across time. And that's evident by the NFHS five results that a lot of uh, ongoing nice trajectories of decline across states have started appearing as stagnating. And that's also worth inquiring um, as what is the, ex the again, a policy level in interest that we have observed is to understand the explanation between what explains the lack of change across this period. So we'll try to understand that through the exemplars that we have selected across the period of five and 15 again. Next slide, please. So, the overall approach within each exemplar state that we selected is we are using a mixed method case study design, um, very similar to what you have heard before. But the advantage that we have is that we are following the first steps of giants and um, we already have a great body of work created by stories of change and a great body of work already existing for the exemplars in global health, the stunting pillar. And we are trying to bring about the best in the both worlds to create the best and the most relatable lessons from the uh, exemplars. So we use a hybrid framework uh, that includes both the UNICEF nutrition framework, uh, 
as well as the policy analysis framework that uh, Stuart just uh, took us through during his presentation. And for within each state, we start with laying down the contextual landscape. This is done by the means of literature review and the essential lens that we use to do this review is the political economy lens. This is further supported by um, drawing insights from multiple data sources, for example, census, national sample survey report to bring in indicators on development indicators across health, gender, poverty, infrastructure, to create an overall state profile to understand what the state is like. This is further informed by the unit level data analysis from the NFHS data that um, we also run the decomposition analysis to identify which factors have contributed to the change in child uh, height for age set score and create slices for each of the components on which factors are contributing what percentage of change. In addition, as was the policy interest to identify uh, the inequities across the nutrition outcomes and whether the decline that has been happening across the exemplar states is in which group, say it is across a special, special social uh, group, a caste or a gender, or um, it's uniform across all the wealth quintiles or is it for a specific quintile? So that again is a lens that we use to understand the decline across the various states. So once this information is collected for a state, uh, we are in a position to identify the sectors that have uh, contributed to the change. And the sectors have been not limited to health. They are way beyond including sectors like education, food supplies, consumer affairs, um, education, uh, water, water sanitation, wash, etc. So within these, we identify the documents from ranging from vision documents, strategy documents, um, planning documents, guidelines, evaluation reports, um, using the hybrid framework to identify what worked. And this is corroborated by interviews with key stakeholders at all levels, state level, district level, frontline workers, community members, civil society members, um, again, to corroborate the findings on what is the driver of change? What are the mechanisms of change? Once the information, the evidence is triangulated, what we end up with is be are the best practices. And I must say that these best practices are not really neat and they're usually a mix of multiple things. So these are essentially a mix of interventions and strategies that present in a variable mix across the states, uh, suitable or optimum for that state's context. Um, to conclude, I would say, uh, Exemplar stories are stories of hope. Uh, they celebrate the hard work and thought leadership of individuals and teams that have worked hard to set up systems that work. And it's also a reinforcement, reinforcement to what is known about the interventions, the implementation strategies on how the scientific interventions or um, discoveries are implemented at scale. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Drishti. I, I really love uh, where you ended, you know, saying that the exemplar stories are celebrations of a lot of people's great hard work in, in trying to make the world a better place. So, you know, so thank you for ending us on that note of hope. Uh, I will also say thank you to all the panelists. Absolutely every single one of you kept to, kept to time, which means that we have about um, 25 odd minutes for uh, questions and comments. Uh, there are some that have uh, begun to come in, so let me um, let me just get get going on those. Um, there's a, a question here from um, Julian uh, Shalimbo. I think I got that right, Julian Shalimbo. Um, so studies based on, and maybe I'm going to direct this question to to you, Sophie. Um, Studies based on RCTs have shown that nutrition sensitive interventions have an impact on stunting, but with a relatively small effect size. Here, looking at real life experience, we see the, the big importance of nutrition sensitive interventions or indirect action. So can you elaborate a little on this? Is it, a, is it related to a matter of um, starting from a different level of coverage of interventions or is it something, something else? And I know we've talked about that, so I'm sure, I know you have a lot to say. Uh, yeah, so we well, to we, can, to, we could easily spend an hour on this. We actually had a full session uh, in at the Micronutrient Forum devoted to some of these issues as to why is, are there differences between trial data and what you see in real life. So uh, I, I think the answer to that is that real life looks at a reality of 
people and their practices, which are generally different from what you have in an experimental setting where even the controlled populations are exposed to a level of home visitation or questioning or uh, scrutiny that may change behavior. And we know that uh, for a large extent uh, with the observed Hawthorne effects of repeated visits in maternal child health in, in uh, population settings where you start off with an assumption of a mortality rates in the background and you find during the course of the study that the actual mortality rates go down just because they are under scrutiny and study. Now, cluster randomized trials, I'll give you an example of uh, uh, water sanitation hygiene and, and particularly these recent large trials in Africa and Asia, Shine and uh, Wash Benefits have shown no effect in those situations or circumstances of uh, uh, those interventions on nutrition and growth. But even the authors themselves recognize that those conditionalities of those trials could have influenced the direction of effect. And therefore, when you go to real life settings, as I've just shown you from our example work, you do find that there are benefits that can be attributed to changes in water sanitation and hygiene. So my own read on this is that I would probably um, uh, give greater weightage to what is real life learning in those circumstances, not over inflate the effect of a particular intervention, but consider those as important uh, um, enabling environmental conditions for improvements in health and nutrition. Now, the other important thing uh, to mention is that the benefits of many of those interventions uh, or um, uh, conditionalities are generally to more than nutrition. Uh, you know, investing in safe water, uh, hygiene, and uh, sanitation, for, for an, uh, as an example, is not just for its benefits on nutrition and growth. It's a fundamental human right and its benefits in terms of health and other parameters. Uh, and I don't have to tell how important it is for women's empowerment to have some of those uh, facilities available. Um, and in many parts of uh, South Asia for security. The, these are things that you do for a range of other benefits also. So to answer your question, uh, in the weightage of evidence, although we give greater um, uh, weightage to randomized controlled trials and especially cluster randomized trials, but I think the truth probably lies somewhere in between what you get from large scale effectiveness evaluations in those trials and, and to studies such as the ones that we have shared today, which is basically a real lived experience, which has a lot of the other drivers and factors contributing to it as well. Great, uh, thank you, Sophie. Yeah, definitely, you know, we continue to have to think through these things. Um, I have another question here that uh, maybe I will direct to Stuart and to Rasmi. So this is from um, Muhammad Bhuya in Bangladesh, who's the founder at the Center for Qualitative uh, Research. So the question is, I, I believe this is a question of um, missing linkages or prioritization. I am still, I, I have this image of this barrel with, with vertical um, uh, that, that Lawrence shows in, in some of his slides. The question is, goes like this, what if we have commitment, coherence, data, evidence, capacity, and leadership, but don't have accountability and financing? Um, you know, is there a way for us to kind of, you know, say anything about the critical ingredients here and what absolutely needs to be in place for, for things to start moving? So maybe Stuart and then Rasmi, if you could reflect on any of that from the, from the India case studies. Yeah, that's uh, it's a great question, actually. And the, yeah, the, the barrel had vertical slats. And if you're pouring water in a barrel and one of those slats is much lower, then the water will spill out at, and it will only stop at the level of the lowest slat, if you like. Um, so, the, so that's really about, you know, what is crucial and what is essential or what is desirable, what is essential with regard to certain uh, factors. And um you know, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer, and it'll vary in, in different contexts. But what's important is that some factors are needed before others. There's a sequencing uh, as well that's important. Um, I think the other aspect is if you take a temporal, if you look at the long term, in the long term, you're going to need those sort of seven factors to kick in at some point uh, for sustainable 
progress and you know embedded uh, change really uh, that's that's what we found at least in the 15 year time periods that we were we were looking at it's hard to to imagine a situation uh, at all levels where there is positive change when for example you, you you don't have data or you don't have any form of accountability in a democratic uh, system of governance um, but it's the way in which I think a lot of this is in the process side it's the way in which these factors uh, in, are integrated and interlinked over time that is important to understand. And from that understanding and the discussions across, let's say, neighboring countries or other countries of similar, to some extent, similar context, every country is different, of course, but uh, that we can learn things and we can understand uh, at least what, how not to repeat mistakes, you know, and, and I think... Um, uh, yeah, so over time, probably you need to see certain aspects of those factors kicking in uh, to make long-term sustained change, I would say. Rasmi, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Stuart. I, I don't think I can put it in a better way than what Stuart just said. I think the, all the factors are quite interlinked. From our uh, success story in Odessa, what we learned is Odessa was there, uh, all the, they had all the key ingredients, but until the financing restructuring happened around early 2000s, they couldn't uh, put the money into the social sector to be able to influence the programming uh, and uh, influence the determinants. So I, I think oh, once you have uh, the leadership, the intent to uh, influence nutrition, then all the other factors also become important. Even if you have finance, if there is no intent, then probably you won't go much far. If you have the commitment and leadership in place, then you will find ways to work with. And once systems are established, then over time, even as changes happen, the systems will figure it out how to uh, work within that. And I think COVID is a prime example with changes due to COVID, the countries have been hit economically as well. So moving forward, that's something we should look at to see where uh, su successes have happened previously, how post-COVID, what is happening in those um, nations or sub-nations. Thank you for the question. Great, thanks. So, so I have another question here that I, I think relates broadly to issues related to the use of evidence. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to maybe ask, um, uh, both to come in on that because I know you're trying to take you know lead people to using the evidence on you know from these but the question is from Mesfin uh, Bayero and he asks you know what are some key factors that need to be considered to bridge the what of what we are learning here uh, and the evidence to the how so maybe both you could you could kick in a little bit on that and then you know maybe Zofi and, and Rasmi if there are insights from the uh, from the case studies on you know, or Stuart on how evidence is used, if there's anything specific that you'd like to, to allude to or mention, that would be great. So maybe both you could kick off um, a little bit there. Yeah, thanks, Bonima. Happy to jump in and uh, welcome um, other panelists to also add. Um, I think ev generating evidence and understanding what has worked, I think is only one part of the puzzle. Um, as we all know, country context matters and one size is not going to fit all. So you're going to have to adapt those best practices or the strategies that worked for country A into country B or state A to state B. So context and circumstances absolutely matter. I think the second piece we've learned and admittedly exemplars is a nascent program. We launched uh, about eight, nine months ago. So we are trying different approaches to reach the target audiences that matter to us. And uh, the second piece for us is everything is uh, cyclical. You need to have the right conversations at the right time point in that cycle of decision-making. Uh, investment cases don't get developed every year. There is a cycle. Not all countries develop them at the same time cycle. So it, it takes, I think, uh, patience and perseverance to be able to crack that nut with the target audiences, maybe decision makers, maybe funders. I think the third uh, important learning for us has been uh, we all consume information in different ways. Again, one size doesn't fit all. 
Some people take it in infographics. Some people take it in one pagers. Some people want the detailed, you know, uh, 60, 70 page document. So we need to also adapt and we need to meet the target audiences, the places where they want to be met. And I'll pause and see if our colleagues have other additional things to add. Thank you. Yes, who would like to go, go next? Stuart, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, that was a that was a great uh, response from Bose. I agree totally. It's cyclical, and I think one of the big steps for step forwards in recent years has been to articulate this data value chain or data value cycle more appropriately. So, if evidence is to be used, it needs it needs to be usable. It needs to be actionable. It needs to to be available to the right person at the right time in the right form, um, and uh, so that requires. Uh, us to understand that ecosystem, if you like, of, of data and evidence, and to be able to, to work with that to make sure that those opportunities, and there will be opportunities over different timelines when data is required for decisions, uh, that, that we seize those opportunities or, or key uh, professionals responsible for nutrition relevant data seize those opportunities in country uh, to, to enable ultimately to raise the chances that those data will be used, recognizing there are other political factors uh, beyond data per se that will be will be, be important for any decisions but nonetheless i think we can we can uh, raise the chances that uh, key data will be used at the right time so, <clears throat> would you like to comment on, on this yeah so Panama, from my perspective i mean i agree with what uh, bose and stuart have said the, the one powerful thing that I will say from practical experience of trying to broker nutrition uh, analyses and, uh, and policy relevant um, recommendations at country level is that the more granular you are, the more subnational you are in terms of depicting where there are pockets of people falling behind or populations falling behind, the more relevant it becomes. I think we very frequently look at things in the aggregate and the aggregate may be useful from some kind of a comparative evaluation in general, but it's pretty much hopeless when it comes to local level planning. So one lesson that I've learned is that the more uh, subnational and particularly relevant to administrative level units you are, the more relevant it is. Uh, and and also in looking at things that are within the jurisdiction of people. So if your audience is policymakers who have the ability to change many of the things that you are talking about, uh, then I would certainly focus my attention in the recommendations on things that we can hope to change. I mean, there's no point in going to people and talking about large scale poverty alleviation strategies if they don't have anywhere with all to change that, but what they can change within their environment in terms of fixing things in relation to education systems or health systems or um, uh, safety nets that exist. Um, I, I think the more pointed, the more pragmatic we are when we take these kind of holistic analyses, the, the more success uh, we are going to see in terms of people taking this up. And the last point I would say is that there is a risk in some of these analyses also that I think people should be aware of. So when you put it all together, you also give people uh, what I call a pop-out opportunity. Well, things didn't change because he didn't do it or this sector didn't do it or that sector didn't do it. And I think it's a, it's a big uh, responsibility on the part of researchers to make sure that when we analyze and present this, that the, the, you know, the best does not become the enemy of the good, that we should, Taylor makes some of these messages to your audience and policymakers on the ground. Yeah, thank you. That, that is so resonating with you know the kind of work that, that we end up doing and having to do in India and the kind, kinds of requests that we get. So uh, Drishti and Rashmi, you're both smiling. So I'm going to ask you if you have any reflections on this, because I, this is a very important question. You know, we study these successes and we enjoy them uh, really so much, but what next? <laughs> so, so maybe Drishti first and then Rasmi. So for our work, uh, what has helped us is engaging with stakeholders early. So uh, getting their inputs even at the research question level, at the 
methodology stage where they can have their inputs, uh, their specific policy uh, questions be incorporated, if at all, that comes in our purview. Um, that creates an engagement at an early level, and um, that's probably one way of thinking through. And that also creates an opportunity for us to hear what is most concerning to them and um, probably frame the answers in a way that's most palatable for their use. Oh. Thank you, Yan. Yeah, and, and we are coming into a challenge space on that for, for India with the new data coming up. Rasmi? Yeah, I just want to add that in our uh, experience with the stories of change results being shared with the states, uh, we have seen positive uptake of this uh, evidence, and which also actually led to more demand for evidence from uh, the state governments and led to other studies. So it was actually uh, quite um, fulfilling to see that there is appetite for this kind of evidence uh, for, uh, and actually they are curious to know what more, what more and how can, can we do it better to improve uh, child nutrition. So I think that there is space uh, and it is about uh, the timing and uh, deep engagement with the states. Uh, and with different stakeholders that inform the policy makers. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I, I'm going to just pose one last uh, question, which um, you know is is one of these what next and what more kind of questions. A question from F. Largo in the Philippines, who asks about, I, I think, reflecting on the results from you know the education sector. How appropriate would school be as an intervention setting? In, in countries where school participation is, is quite high. So I'm wondering if anyone would, would like to take that. Um, you know, we typically don't think of school as a, as a key sector for nutrition uh, improvement, but these findings on the critical importance of, of education are really quite undeniable across all the different uh, case studies. Uh, so maybe a you know, quick one on that uh, from you, Sophie, and perhaps uh, Rasmi, if you'd like to come in on that. Rasmi, go ahead. Uh, in terms of uh, education, uh, one of the things that, uh, based on what we understand from Tamil Nadu, there was an intervention to delay age at marriage, but also to keep children in school at the same time. So uh, they, the state implemented a program that if uh, girls stayed at school for more than 10th grade, go beyond 10th grade, then they get an X amount uh, to uh, help them with uh, later on with marriage. So they, it, it seems like there are certain, uh, and then there are examples of uh, giving materials to students, uh, girls in, in Bihar to improve education. So there are different types of interventions that are related to education specifically. And I think as far as for nutrition is concerned, what is coming out is women's education is extremely important. So it may not be directly nutrition related intervention, but the underlying aspect of women getting more than 10 years of education and delaying age at marriage. These are the aspects that can, if that can be addressed through school level interventions. I think that would be helpful. Great, thank you, Rasmi. Again, bringing us back to indirect. So, uh, Zulfi, and then maybe uh, Drishti, if you'd also like to come. So, um, I couldn't agree more. I think education happens to be one of the strongest. And the important thing to underscore is one of the best interventions in terms of sustained benefits. So, I frequently tell people that in our own experience of working in health systems and at population level, there are a few things that if you get communities to adapt and to move to, they almost never slide back. Now, going to a facility for skilled birth uh, attendance and uh, facility births is one of those. People who get used to it mm -hmm. will never slide back to a traditional birth attendance. It's just, I've never observed it, despite the fact that people have had conflict, they've had insecurity, they've had, you know, COVID. The interesting thing is in COVID related uh, 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 stringent restrictions, uh, the one thing that we did not observe is people not going to facilities, not having skilled attendants deliver them or going back to traditional birth attendance. That did not happen. 
education is one of those. When you educate girls, and in particular, if you empower uh, uh, girls as part of that process, uh, you put in place a whole cycle of change and development that has benefits that go way beyond just nutrition. And we've seen this time and time again, uh, not only in South Asia, but elsewhere. So I consider that as a phenomenal uh, intervention to have. Now you asked a question earlier on, Purnima, which is very important for South Asia, uh, which is, you know, how should we do this? How should we impact adolescent health and nutrition, particularly where we recognize it's such a major driver of, um, um, uh, let's say, less than optimal reproductive health performance and 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 the answer to that is you have to start early. I don't think that there is any benefit at times in starting later in adolescence when the dye is already cost. So we really need to start with school age children and particularly with school age girls and, and between the five to 10 uh, or 15 years age gr uh, group where, which is you know now euphemistically called the missing middle because we have so little information there. And that's where you have the best value for money for investments and impact around health, nutrition, mental health, uh, also developmental uh, opportunities, the second window that you have in many of these circumstances and opportunities to optimize both growth as well as micronutrient on uh, malnutrition. Great, thank you so much. So um, we are gonna move towards closing. So what I'm gonna do is invite uh, us in reverse order. So Drishti, you get to comment on this thing and maybe give us your one minute uh, closing together in one minute. Um, my question that I'd like each of you to just, you know, maybe reflect on in that one minute is, is what lies ahead? You know, where do we go from here? To me, this is an incredible collection and all of you are doing incredible work in pulling all of this together. Uh, so if you wanna say just a little bit about that and then if you wanna reflect on, on this question related to education. So maybe Drishti first and then Rasmi uh, and then Sophie Stewart and we'll end with you both, all right? So a minute or less each, please. Thank you. Drishti, over to you. So um, for the education part, I just uh, wanted to add to what Rashmi and uh, Dr. Pata had already said is the key interventions that we came across were infrastructure being built closer to homes where girls felt more empowered to reach out to these schools. Toilet facilities for girls, that was also a feature that encouraged girls to stay in school for longer. And lastly, something which is uh, equal for both the genders that was implemented through schools were the midday meals that encouraged school students to stay in schools for longer. That was regarding to the education questions on specific interventions within schools that encourage education. Coming to what lies ahead, um, for us, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a complicated uh, question because we're still dismantling a lot of information from various states. However, what I can reflect on is, uh, based on the experience gained so far, is um, going deeper down within the state, within the understanding state's context and um, the within state disparity across districts, across uh, uh, wealth, across social uh, groups is important to actually explain the change whenever possible. So. That's something that we can keep in mind while going forward, while making uh, in, uh, interpretations for countries or states. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say that there are no magic bullets to improving maternal and child uh, health and nutrition. We have to place equal emphasis on both the direct determinants as well as the underlying determinants, nutrition specific and nutrition sensitive interventions. Moving forward, India's national policy framework already offers, has all these interventions in place, social safety net programs, health and nutrition programs, everything is in there. What needs to happen is to make all these programs converge on the first thousand day households. That is one of the way forward. The second one is we need to further dig into the inter-district variability within the state, understand what are the factors that are driving differences within in these small pockets, which operate under the same state level policy framework. So I think those are the two things for me. Thanks. Work is cut out for you. So please, you're closing. 
No, I've already said what, what I needed to say for education, but one thing I will underscore again in the context of our own geographies, particularly in, um, um, in Pakistan in the work that we have done, is the very important contribution that we are seeing from family planning programs on improving nutrition. And that's not very evident when you, you look at the broad literature in terms of just doing a meta-analysis of interpregnancy intervals or, or some of those. But very clearly we see from the provinces that have done much better, the North, the Northern part of Punjab, that a major contributor to change overall in nutritional status is really improvements in um, uh, ostensibly maternal nutrition, largely driven by family planning and uptake of modern conception. I think that's a very important finding. We don't have data on gestational weight gain. We don't have data on birth weight. But I think we have all of these pointers that tell us that the direction of effect would have to be from something like this. And, and I think that's an important policy driver. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart? Um, yeah, it's, it, well, it's all been said. <laughs> I'd just like to say something else, which is related to, we talk about living documents. Um, this, I think we need a kind of a living library of, of experience, if you like, uh, that is accessible, uh, that we retain the connectivity, and I love the example as platform for that, that needs to be visibly, vi visually appealing. Um, I also think that we, over time, need to, to focus on malnutrition in all its forms, uh, double burden, overweight uh, and obesity as well as undernutrition. But really the emphasis has to be on understanding learning and how people learn from uh, experiences and to use that understanding to, to strengthen our engagement with this kind of issue. Thanks. Thank you, Stuart. Perfect segue, both. Well, thank you, Purnima. Uh, nothing else to add except to say the exemplar's journey continues. As I said, it takes a global village to get us there. So we welcome you to join us in this journey, exemplars.health. Feel free to reach out. We're always looking for new ideas and ways to improve the content. Thanks again. Wonderful. So thank you all so very much, uh, all of you panelists, uh, for joining us today. Your research is incredibly inspiring. And I think in a world of a lot of bad news. It's always just such a pleasure to reflect on what we're learning from success. Uh, unfortunately, malnutrition in all its forms has been with us for decades and is likely to remain a major challenge. And I think we need all the good news and inspiration we can get here to keep us focused on what works. So again, thank you to the audience for your great participation. We weren't able to, to get to all the questions, but I invite everyone to read the New Lancet series, to read uh, the rich, rich literature from the exemplars and global health team and the stories of change teams and to visit our websites to dig in. I wanna say a special thank you to the free and the exemplars and global health communications teams who brought this all together. A lot of hard work. And last but not least, I invite everyone to join us free next Thursday, April 8th at 9.30 a.m. for a seminar on examining the state of community-led development programming. So thank you all again so much. Um, and thank you, Katarla and team.